Good day, folks, and welcome to the Anorak Review Show, with I, your host, the Anorak. Well, here it is. It has finally come. An album that has been long overdue. Possibly more so than any other record I've looked at so far, or even will do in the near future. Said to be one of the most iconic albums of all time, one of the best-selling albums of all time, and even considered by some to be the greatest album of all time ever. And I'm sure many of you would guess already from the start what it might actually be just from reading the title of this video alone. And the thumbnail. But I'm also sure some of you might be curious as to how this album came to be. Well, allow me to offer you a little insight into the background and history behind this iconic and classic album. <laughs> Soon after working on their previous album, Medal, in 1971, Pink Floyd got together at some point to pitch what would be their next studio album. Bassist and primary songwriter Roger Waters came up with a concept that revolved around things that, in his word, made people mad. No doubt influenced by not only their lives and the pressures put upon them as a record-making group, but also their former frontman Sid Barrett, who was forced out of the band years prior because of his declining health and mental issues due to dosing on LSD and other drugs. He also came up with an even cleverer idea and method. They would perform and develop this overall material, this piece for assorted lunatics, while they were live on concert. And so, they first began making demos and even played what they had so far live as early as January to February 1972, just over a year before its eventual release. While they already had their choice of an album title well in advance, they had to rename it to Eclipse for a while when they received word that a lesser known British blues rock band called Medicine Head would be releasing an album of a very similar name. But when that album proved, to be, proved soon enough to be a commercial dud, the Floyd eventually decided to revert back to their album title. Then, at one point early on, later in early 1972, the band had to, had to temporarily halt work on this album in order to work on a soundtrack for the film La Vallée, aka Obscured by Clouds, which I reviewed last year if you want to know about that one. As this long tour of theirs went on, they continued to refine this grand piece, even actually started recording it in, where else, but Abbey Road Studios. Back then it was just called EMI Studios, but still. And soon enough, by 1st of March 1973, over 50 years ago, the album was finally released and became a massive hit since then. Certified about 15 times in the UK alone, peaked number 2 in the UK officials album chart, and to this day, sold over 45 million copies worldwide. To call that a musical blockbuster could arguably be an understatement. But does all that commercial and financial success and pop culture power for half a century now at this point automatically make it a good album? Well... Let's find out for ourselves as we jump into Pink Floyd's 1973 magnum opus, The Dark Side of the Moon. Now, like with the ELO 2 album that I looked at in the previous episode, the copy that I have isn't a gatefold, sadly. It's, it's just a single LP package. But hey, it's still a copy and it works, so I digress. The cover itself... Where do I even begin with this one? Even if you never actually listened to any of their music within, or any Pink Floyd music at all, you would have no doubt have seen this artwork before, 
or at least some parody or homage to it at some point. This is once again the work and effort of the folks at Hypnosis, as well as George Hardy, who also worked on the artwork for Led Zeppelin's debut album, Pink Floyd's next album, which you are here, and Genesis's The Lambs Lie Down on Broadway. This stylized etching of a clear, transparent prism being penetrated by a thick beam of white light through one side before bursting out the other side in an array of striking colours. And all this is set up against a pure black background. As the late keyboardist Richard Wright put it, it's a smart, simple, neat, bold and classy design. A very classy design. It instantly grabs the attention of the human eye and fills its observers with a sense of mystery and curiosity. Now that is Pink Floyd artwork and Hypnosis artwork in general really at the finest. Or at least it would be if the copy I own didn't have the titles and the little quadraphonic logos on the corners. I usually prefer my album covers to be textless, thank you very much. But still, great cover art regardless. For me, this whole album could be a prequel of sorts to The Wall, or at least highlighting a particular period of Pink's life. A time when he already had many bricks building up his metaphorical wall, but still has yet to be completely overwhelming and blocking out of such. Metal chronicling an amount of time in Pink's young adult life before Darkseid, animals delving into his despondent view of politicians, celebrities, and other people in power, seeing them as a class of animals, and after, set after Darkseid but before the wall, just before the wall, and momentary lapse of reason, dealing with what his life and views might have been like several years after his wall had been torn down. Again, this could be my interpretation, of course. The other albums I hope to get to and analyse soon enough eventually in time. But right now, let's deal with this one, shall we? We begin the album with an overture of sorts, titled Speak To Me. I'd say whether this counts as a song of its own or not is kind of up for debate. But either way, I wouldn't be able to care any less because this is right away one of the best openings to any album in general. Starting off with that deep and faint drum emulating the sound of a heartbeat that slowly fades in and rises from the darkness of silence. We hear other sounds very similar to what we would hear over the course of the album. Ticking clocks, cash registers, mad laughter, helicopter-esque noises, and even a woman wailing. And upon all that, we hear the voice of someone or two, likely some of the staff at the studio, admitting to being mad for years, always being mad and knowing so. And already we spot one of the major themes within this record, madness, of which we'll touch more upon later, especially with the song centered around it. As of here, it gives its listener a small yet good enough taster of sounds and ideas that are to come very soon along the course of the album. And underneath all this is a low piano chord that, having been reversed, builds up until it overtakes and envelops the other sounds before imploding into the very next track, Breathe. Where we're greeted by the four members and their main instruments proper. The keyboards of Richard Wright, the bass of Roger Waters, the drummers of Nick Mason, and the guitars of David Gilmore. Playing off that sweet, groovy, spacey, and recognizable melody, especially with that pedal steel guitar, making almost it making it almost feel like Hawaii in space. Maybe that's that that's that maybe how I would describe this in the most simple words as possible. Soon we get our first proper vocals from David himself, along with some nice multi-layered harmonics making it almost seem like the other members could well be singing along behind him as well. Breathe in the air, don't be afraid to care. As in to taking all that's around you while offering enough confidence and empathy to care for all that's around you. 
Leave, but don't leave me. Or at least wait a minute so I can go find my phone and wallet and bring them with me. Look around, choose your own ground. We have a wide range of floors for you to choose from, such as tiles, marble, wood, and even grass. The idea of a song about breathing in air has its roots just a few years earlier when Roger, along with composer Ron Giesen, who also worked with the Floyd for the titular suite from the Atom Heart Mother album, worked on a soundtrack for a documentary called The Body, back in also back in 1970, which delved into the inner internal workings of the human body. And the soundtrack itself was called Music from the Body. That said, aside from both sharing the opening line of Breathe in the Air, the, similar the similarities just end there, really. Run, rabbit, run. Dig that hole, forget the sun. Which rabbit, rabbit will likely forget anyway, because Winnie the Pooh keeps getting stuck in his hole. When at last the work is done, don't sit down, it's time to dig another one. And this time, make it big and wide enough for Pooh to actually fit in through. You gotta have these things in advance, you know. The song itself is a moral cautionary tale on how we should live life to its best while working hard enough to live long and fly high, but at the same time, subtly warning us that having to work and live too much trying to balance on the biggest wave, as in taking a big and dangerous risk, could very well lead you into an early grave. The character of Floyd Pinkerton, or Pink for short, aka the Bob Geldof character from the Wall movie, could be seeing himself as a rabbit running relentlessly and having to dig one hole after another, a musician having to write, sing, record and play one song after another, he could already feel the stress of being a rock star settling into him, wishing for a moment to just breathe in and choose his own ground for himself. But this is just the beginning, right here and now. Next is On The Run, a mostly instrumental piece that's dominated by sinister synthesizers, especially the EMS Synthi AKS which already does fantastically well at creating this unsettling and disorienting mood, one of paranoia and anxiety. And it's kind of fitting since Richard Wright had a fear of flight at the time. The music itself makes you think of an old video game level set inside a big, vast, almost empty spaceship of sorts, having to run and explore through it while it's on high alert with red siren lights going off and spinning endlessly almost like the Pillar of Autumn level from the first Halo game. In the song itself, we could hear an actual airport announcement, along with the sounds of someone running and panting, hence the title. And of course, the thing that makes this travelling sequence the most well-known is its use of a Doppler effect, which is achieved by using a VCS-3 synthesizer, making this helicopter-like sound, this, along with the running audio, paints this picture of a man running through a dark, vast area, out seemingly in the middle of nowhere, having escaped some kind of compound, perhaps, as various choppers fly and pass on by, with searchlights beaming down and scanning for the escapee. Alternatively, with the flight announcement, this could also be interpreted as someone running through an airport, hoping to not miss a particular departure. This is likely what Pink was going through, that sense of anxiety and fear when going off to fly overseas from his native home of Britain, possibly for the first time, likely to form in concerts around the world. This would eventually be contrasted about 14 and a half years later by learning to fly, where Pink finally takes courage and braces flight having finally conquered his fears already and opening up at last. But here, now, he not only feels the pressure and fear of running late, but also the possibility of said flight might even be ending up falling down and crashing. Halfway into the track, we hear road manager Roger Manifold, or The Hat, 
saying what seemed to be his motto, live for today, gone tomorrow, that's me, before letting out this filtered yet very creepy cackle. Already we hear and feel the very madness settling in. Soon it culminates in a breathtaking climax, where what seems to be a jet engine starts building up along with maniacal laughter, and it all eventually crashes down, literally in a ball of fiery death. As the booms calm and settle away, we hear one more of that parting and running as well, as distant, distant whirring like one of those helicopters observing the crash, and the person is trying to run and escape the crash. If Nightmares could have a soundtrack, this could very well be one of many countless tracks on that playlist. After that, it's time for time. After On the Run fades away into the darkness, the sounds of ticking clocks fade in. Multiple clocks, in fact. Before it all suddenly erupts into alarms going off and chiming. No doubt alerting anyone who dares snooze off while listening to this whole album all the way through. It also gives the feeling of being forced to wake up and being thrust out of a nightmare, such being the previous song. All those clocks were apparently recorded individually by audio engineer Alan Parsons, who also did the engineering for this album, in an antique sh shop to test the quadraphonic sound. Not necessarily for the song itself, but I guess the band really liked it and decided to incorporate it in. Once all those ringings in your ears start to settle down and fade away, we hear a constant tick-tock, tick-tock, tick-tock sound that was done by Roger Waters plucking two muted strings on his bass, continuing to emphasise the time motif of this track. Then we get some dramatically striking chords along with Nick Mason playing some sick roars on some rototoms, and it's such a fantastic build-up, leaving its listeners on the edge and unsure what's to come. Then, two and a quarter minutes in, the music kicks on as we hear David singing once more, ticking away the moments that make up a dull day, fritter and waste the hours in an offhand way. So that must be must have what it felt to be a kid in the 70s when there was no social media streaming sites or gaming apps. Kicking around on a piece of ground in your home ground, hometown, waiting for someone to show you the way. Is this the way to Amarillo? Every night I've been hugging my pillow, dreaming dreams of Amarillo and Sweet Marie who's waiting for me. Then Richard Wright takes over singing for the heavenly bridge section that's eerily similar to the vocal bits of Echoes from Metal the more I think about it. But I suppose would be expected, if not appropriate, since that 23 minute long track could be seen as a precursor and foretaste for this album as a whole, both on a lyrical and musical standpoint. Anyway, as you might guess and imagine already, this song in particular deals with time itself, how we may spend or waste it. This realisation of our own mortality and not only how close death can be, but also how inevitable it is. Finding out 10 years have gone behind you and trying to catch up with the sun, but it's sinking already. That time flows much faster than we may perceive it to be. And of course, what great Pink Floyd song be complete without a long and fantastic guitar solo from old Gilmore. In the second verse, the sun races around to come up behind you again, it's the same in a relative way, but you're older. And by relative, I think he means the sun has already lived millions of years old and will continue to live for millions of years more. Perhaps here in this song, Pink is starting to realise how old he has become already and is soon getting himself into a midlife crisis of sorts, being reminded of the thought of death itself and how his father died in World War II and maybe his mother as well whether a long while ago, or even recently. In the second bridge, featuring some gospel-like backing vocals from Doris Troy, Leslie Duncan, and Barry St. John, Richard goes on to say that every year's getting shorter. Never seem to find the time, 
plans that either come to naught or half a page of scribbled lines. Kind of like a lot of my fanfictions. Hanging on quiet desperation is the English way. That and stiff of the lips, keeping calm and carrying on, those two. Then Richard seems to get a little bit meta when he sings, The time is gone, the song's over, thought I had something more to say. Then this immediately goes into a reprise of Breathe, often referred to as Home Again as if they couldn't come up with a proper ending to the time song, so they just went with a repeat of a previous song. Which isn't really too bad. It's cool to have reoccurring themes and motives, especially for a concert album like this. Here, David relishes at the idea of coming home at last, cold and tired and feeling warm in his bones beside the fire. Assuming, of course, it's a natural fire and not one of those faux fireplaces where it's just a looping screen of a fire. Just then, far away across the fields, the iron bell begins to toll as the faithful are called to their knees so they can hear the softly spoken magic spells. Wingardium Leviosa. Actually, this could be interpreted as a church service beginning to start, like, say, a wedding or a funeral. The latter would be very fitting, of course, as with one last organ chord, we transition to the last song of side one of the dark side of the moon. That, of course, being the great gig in the sky. This mortal sequence takes on a very quiet and somber tone as Richard switches from organ to piano, playing away a slow and mournful melody. And gradually, some of the other instruments rise up behind as well. Bass and pedal steel guitar and all. But the piano still remains dominant and in centre stage. Meanwhile, we hear yet another spoken word quote from one of the folks who worked at the studio at the time. This time a janitor named Gary O'Driscoll. Who, among many questions, was asked whether he was afraid of dying. To which he answered, no, he's not frightened of dying. And why would he? There's no reason for it, you gotta go sometime. Any time will do. Then, just when things start to ease down a bit, the music itself soon explodes into this otherworldly extravaganza as Nick Mason kicks on the drums, Richard switches back to organ, the hammered organ, of course, and Claire Toy herself takes on the lead as she lets out some breathtaking wailing vocals. And they say the po the poetic one-woman whale trope is overdone in movies like Gladiator, Black Hawk Down, Passion of the Christ, District 9, and Avatar. They are, they are overused, but this outclasses that lot. Clara herself did about two or three takes, and the final result is a mix of the best bits from each. And she wasn't even sure if her contributions would even make it to the final mix itself, until she picked up a copy of the album one day soon after. By the mid-2000s, as a result of a lawsuit, she was able to get full co-credit with Richard on the song itself. And honestly, good for her. It wouldn't exactly be the same without her unique voice. Without the need for any lyrics or words, not even with Claire singing out her heart like in an opera, it still manages to get across its theme as best as possible. That opening piano feels like a lonely soul just having just deceased and brushed off the mortal coil. But then it drifts upward and beyond, to where that great gig resides in the sky, in heaven. Best And best yet, you don't even have to pre-order a ticket online. The main centre point where Claire and the organs and the drums play together is where the heart of the gig resides. It shows death and the afterlife as a place not to be afraid of, but to embrace and look forward to even. A place without fears, pains and pressures, without all that madness of life and reality. It's all captured together within this brilliant track, this little moment alone. Then it calms down once more with that very same emotional piano again, as Claire still sings on, slightly weakened but still carrying on, as if the gig has spent almost 
all of its heavenly energies. We even hear one more voice near the end saying, I never said I was afraid of dying. That voice belonging to Patricia Puddy Waltz, the wife of road manager Peter Waltz and mother of actress Naomi Waltz. Oh yes, that Naomi Watts, the actress you may have known from Holland Drive and King Kong 2005, is the daughter of a Pink Floyd roadie. How awesome is that? Then finally, one last quiet piano chord is stretched out as much as it could before it fades into the darkness. But if you listen closely enough, you could hear a little rising and falling of pitch just, just before it goes out. Whether this was a little error or an artistic choice for such a tiny, small detail that most people would probably wouldn't even be able to pick up at um, first or second listen, is kind of up for debate, really. But anyway, perhaps this whole song is how Pink himself imagines death itself to be. Just another gig to play in, but also where he may hope to see his mummy and daddy again. But till then, he's still stuck here in life with his ever-building war. Along with the underrated Summer 68 from Atapart Mother, and another track on this album that I might talk about soon enough, this may be among Richard Rice's finest songwriting, whether solo or as part of Pink Floyd. And it doesn't even feature any of Roger Waters' lyrical content on it whatsoever, like most of the other tracks here. It is what it is, and it's left to be what it is. And it's the perfect way to close out the first side of this album. It starts at the birth of life with Breathe, travels through the fears of life, death, and existentialism with On the Run and Time and Home Again, until finally coming to acceptance with this great gig in the sky. And a great gig, it no, sounds, no doubt suddenly is.